This is Dr. Joel Janus speaking, and we're going to talk about posterior direct composites. The objectives of this presentation are learning where and when to use posterior direct composites, understand the technique and the rationale for the use of the dental materials involved, and very importantly, conserving tooth structure. The advantages to direct composites follow. We can get excellent aesthetics. We only have to remove diseased tooth structure. Good patient acceptance. And if we do the procedure properly, it's going to last as long as amalgam and maybe even longer. This is a case that I did in my office. And if you look carefully at this, you can see that we're going to do a fixed bridge from this premolar back to the molar. And we're going to do a fixed bridge on the lower, opposing it. If you look at tooth number five, you may notice a little bit of a radiolucency here and here, and a big radiolucency here underneath that DO amalgam. So we're going to open this tooth up and clean it out and then build it up with a base. But in the meantime, we have access to that distal surface so we can check it. And when I had it open, I looked at it and I could find that the, that the uh, caries was. It looked clinically like it was going to go through the enamel. And then there were some catches in the occlusal groove. So if you look at this photograph, you'll see that now the bridges have been completed. They're porcelain fused to metal restorations. And while this was open, I took a small round burr and just cleaned it out. It went, did go in slightly into the dentin and then cleaned these out. And they were only in enamel and seal them up with restorable composite. So this would be an example of minimal invasive dentistry, as opposed to say a class two preparation like you see over here. This is another case for illustration. When I was teaching at UN at UOP in San Francisco. I was in the clinic and the student presented this tooth to me and it was scheduled for an MO amalgam. <clears throat> and so what I did is I suggested to the student that he take a half round burr and only remove caries, nothing else, don't not do a traditional box. And then after it was, all the carriers were removed, I suggested that you just restore it with composite. So this would be another example of only removing the curious tooth structure and, and nothing else. And it's going to leave us a lot stronger tooth with more integrity. So with these three photographs, compare the amount of tooth structure removed to do a conventional amalgam restoration and the tooth adjacent to it. You can imagine that down the line, this tooth's going to have a lot more strength. Question, how long can a class two amalgam last? Well, these x-rays were taken in 2020. These are restorations that I did on my wife in 1960 when I was a dental student at UOP. So they've been there a long time. Number 13 is a DO amalgam. Number 14 is an MO gold inlay. 18 is a MO gold inlay. 19, an MOD gold onlay. And 20, a MOD gold onlay. 
So basically, they've been there for 60 years. And you can see that everything seems to be going well, so they could last much longer. The dentistry, the restorations that we do can last a long time if we diagnose properly and if we do it properly. Here's a close-up photo taken of that amalgam that was done in 1960. And um, I guess the question is, how much longer can it last? These are some examples of large amalgam restorations and what the sequelae can be over the years of chewing and grinding on these teeth. The restorations last a long time, but we begin to notice some cusp fractures because tooth amalgam is a tooth supported restoration and requires more tooth structure removal than composite. Just some other examples, and I think we've all seen this. Not to give amalgam, amalgam a bad reputation because it's an excellent material and one that we definitely should use in certain situations, but this is one of the disadvantages. This is a patient I've followed for many years. When he was 12 years old, there were sticks with an explorer and the occlusal grooves of posterior teeth so the dentist at that time did regular GV black amalgams. And they lasted a long time. But when the patient was in his 50s and 60s, cusps began to fracture. And that led to full coverage crowns in some places. This, uh, the amalgam fractured in this tooth and was replaced with a composite. This one, the mesial marginal ridge fracture was replaced with a gold inlay. So these are the years of placement. So that amalgam, which doesn't look very pretty, has been there since 1946. That inlay was done in 1960. The composite was placed in tooth number four, number three, 1994. In 2006, the lingual cusp fractured off of the second molar and had a gold crown place. In 2017, the distal marginal ridge on tooth number 14, where the inlay was, fractured and was replaced with composite. At the same time, you'll notice on tooth number 15, there was an MO composite place because the mesial marginal ridge fractured from that too. So you can see on the radiograph what it was done. So when you look at the after photo, do you see anything you'd like to fix when the patient comes in back to see you next time? Well, I'm going to see if I can use the pointer here. The only thing that kind of bothers me a little bit, I'd like to round that off so we have a nicer occlusal embrasure. It's working the way it is, but I think that would make it much easier to floss. Later on in 2022, the mesial lingual cusp fractured on that too. And so it was, the existing inlay was micro etched. And then the remaining two structure was etched, bonding agent, and just did a direct composite to replace that mesolingual cusp. These are just examples of how we can uh, keep things to a minimum. This is the lower arch. So that inlay was placed in 1960, still there. That crown had to be done because of a fractured lingual cusp in 2002. 2004, the MOD onlay and gold crown on the second molar were done again because of cusp fractures. This patient really did not have interproximal caries. So here's my point. All of the above dental work could have been prevented 
if preventative resin restoration, PEEP or R's, were done initially and if they were done properly with composite. I have seven children and did PRRs on all their posterior teeth as they erupted and avoided additional dental work into their 50s and 60s. They're now some of them are in their 60s and they haven't had to have any dental work done. This is the same 82 year old patient, the anterior teeth showing uh, normal wear, healthy gingiva. So we did direct composite veneers in 2018 and got this result. Now, the interesting thing about this is if porcelain veneers were done, then we would be removing three quarters of a millimeter of enamel off the labial surface and one and a half to two millimeters off the incisal edge. But by utilizing composite, nothing was removed. We only added to the tooth where things were worn or chipped. On the lower anterior teeth, as you can see, are, are worn through to the dentin. And those were handled with just class six composites, where we, so here again, we didn't have to grind anything off the tooth, we just added what was lost. Came up with this little acronym, ECRC. What does that mean? Prevent, conserve, restore, and get compensated. So P is for preventing oral disease. C is to conserve the structure. R is to restore aesthetics and function. And C, if we want to stay in business, we need to be compensated for service rendered. Now, let's look at a case where there is a catch in that distal hip. So we know we need to do something. So is this going to be a PRR or a class one composite restoration? So let's go through the case and then decide. In the majority of states in the USA, dental hygienists cannot legally pick up a handpiece and remove tooth structure. Therefore, it's up to the dentist to make sure that no caries is left in the grooves under the sealant or the restoration. According to Dr. Edward Lynch of Warwick, UK, he came up with the following statistics. A visual exam with a sharp explorer is about 45% accurate. And an instrument like that is about $20. Then research was done with a di diagnodent laser, which cost about $2,500, and it's about 57% accurate. And then there's another device called a Carries Scan Pro, which is very accurate. And I say this tongue in cheek, but according to me, a half round is 100% accurate, and they don't cost very much. So let's look at the Terry's Scan Pro. Introducing the Carry Scan Pro to improve your assessment of Carry's activity. The Carry Scan Pro is a highly accurate, easy to use handheld device for the early detection and monitoring of dental carries. It identifies lesions at their earliest stage and is more than 92.5% accurate in detecting or probing at Carry's teeth and enamel false positives. Here's how it works. Verify the tube for five seconds. Follow a series of simple prompts until the blue LED indicator starts to flash. Place the sensor on the tube. Carry Scan Pro detects the tube and automatically starts the measurement. The audible tone signals when the measurement is complete, and the result is displayed on the LED indicator and on the LCD screen. 
Well, that is a very effective device to detect carries. If you can't afford the $2,000 for one of those instruments, a half round burr, which is very inexpensive, you can explore those grooves and find out whether there's carries or not. So back to our question of preventative resin restoration or a class one composite. So let's go back to our case. So we take, we catch it with the explorer tip. We know something's going on there. So we take a number half round burr. And we don't need local anesthetic to do this unless it penetrates into the dentin. But if it's only in the enamel, we can clean that out and um, we don't need anesthetic. And then we can restore that. And in this case, I would charge for a PRR or a sealant fee, mainly because it only took five minutes to do it. If we, if it went into the dent and we had to anesthetize, then it would wind up being a regular class one composite. I would not suggest using sealant because it wears faster. Even though these are very small openings, we can use regular restorable composite, and then they're gonna be very long lasting. Another case where a sealant was done on the second molar, and after six years, most of it fell out. You can see there's still a little bit of it left here but in this area. So the question is, why did it fail? Um, I can only guess at this point, but I would think that probably when the sealant was done, there was some carries there and they were sealed over and it broke out or wore out and then it failed. So we had to anesthetize the patient, remove the carries, which went well into the dentin in that central pit. And then we placed a glass ionomer base. But the other extensions weren't like a conventional class one preparation. We just followed out the grooves and cleaned them out with a half round burr. So they did not penetrate into the dentin. So we etch, wash dry, bonding agent, light cure, and then we build it up with composite. And this is a, a little micro brush, which are readily available. And they work really, really well for compressing composite into a tooth. The beauty of that micro brush is that um, it will not stick to the composite and pull back. And you don't have to put any bonding agent on it or anything like that. It just, you can use it dry and it really does a good job of compressing that into all the little irregularities in the tooth. So we were filling the tooth up and we're forming the grooves, fossa, triangular ridges. 
We do this all prior to light curing, or you can use a ball burnisher or IPC instrument. Now, this is a little experiment that I did over 30 years ago. I took two anesthetic corpules and pushed the black plunger down so that they, that they were equidistant from the red line, and then backfilled it with composite. The one on the left was cured from what we would call the occlusal or the end first, and the one on the right was cured from the sides first, and then from the top. And if you look carefully, you'll see that in this case, the rubber stopper was pulled away from the red line a little bit because of the contraction, polymerization shrinkage on the composite. In this case, it was less. So that gave me an indication that if we bulk fill a class one composite and cure it from the occlusal, we're going to be compromising the margin. And we've taken this idea a little bit further and I started researching. And the only thing I could find in the literature was this particular study and they didn't really cure from the sides. They compared curing from the occlusal with curing from on the diagonal. And it significantly reduced the shrinkage. They also found out that if you use a low intensity light, there's less shrinkage than when, with the high powered faster lights. So we started this research project at the University of Utah School of Dentistry to find out the effect of directional curing. We took a standard two millimeter by two millimeter preparation and restored it with composite. These were in extracted teeth and the control group was cured from the occlusal only. The experimental group was cured through the buccal and the lingual and then the occlusal. Then dye was applied these teeth and they were set, cut into sections with a very fine saw you see on the right. And the sections were about one millimeter thick. Now, just looking at this without putting it under a microscope, you can see that the dye actually penetrated down one of the margins, looks like on the buccal margin, it penetrated all the way to the focal wall. So there's an indication that uh, of what we were talking about. Then it was put in a uh, high powered microscope and photographed. So these are some of the images. This one depicts, is taken with a confocal microscope and that's the control group. It was cured from the occlusal first. And in a confocal image, when you get a white line like this, that indicates space. Then we had another group where we light cured from the buccal 20 seconds and from the lingual 20 seconds, and then from the occlusal 20 seconds, and you don't see that white line. So here they are side by side. So that indicated that our theory was correct. This is with a little bit different method, utilizing dye. And you can see it's pretty graphic on this side, how the dye actually penetrated all the way to the focal wall. This is the one where it was secured from the occlusal first. This is the experimental group where we cured through the tooth, through the buccal and the lingual, and then the occlusal. And then here are some other images showing the same thing. So on the left, you can see dye penetration all the way to the pulpal wall and a little bit on the other side because of the contraction. In this one, we've got nice solid margins. So what happens is the shrinkage is greatest in the area where the light is concentrated and bonding within the composite first occurs. When we cure from the occlusal first, the composite is pulled away from a vertical wall and the pulpal wall to a lesser extent. When we cure from the sides first, buccal lingual, and then 
The composite is actually pulled toward all the walls. And this is the key to getting better margins. We found that using high intensity light increases shrinkage. We need to cure through the tooth or at least from an oblique angle before occlusal. And if you have a metal matrix, then we can overcome it by using two millimeter increments on the diagonal so that only two walls are cured at a time. So but going back to our case, we bulk fill that and we light cure through the buckle. And then we light cure through the lingual and then through the occlusal. So here's the result restoration <clears throat> ready to finish. So we go through the finishing process. I'm going to skip over the occlusion. We use a number four round burr and I'll just play this video. We use the side of the burr to go through the groove and to define the fossa. And then at this point, we can go through the uh, Jiffy polishers and uh, finish it down completely. So let's go to the before picture and fast forward to the finished restoration. So that was completed in 1995. And then I was able to see the patient 15 years later and took a photograph. And what do we notice? Well, the tooth is discolored, but the composite has not. But look at the marginal integrity. And so my question is, what can we attribute that marginal integrity to? Well, I submit that um, it's the directional curing that made that possible. And then I guess we can ask the question, how many more years could this last? Well, if it lasts another 15, I'd sure be happy with that longevity. We see an awful lot of this. Composites internationally have a lifespan of between five and seven years. So the question is what went wrong with this? Well, there's a number of things that could have gone wrong. But I submit that um, it probably wasn't cured properly. I've been doing these for a long time, and I fully expect that they're going to last 20 plus years. These are the steps necessary for aesthetic and functional and long term lasting direct composite restorations. So bear with me, there are 10 of them. We do a mock-up for 
shade, form, function, and patient acceptance before the dental dam is played. So before the tooth is dried out, we try some composite on it and make it the correct shade. Moisture control is extremely important and the dental dam is a great asset. We need to do the correct preparation with clean surfaces for bonding. And we might need to make sure that the etching goes a little bit beyond the area of the preparation. So anywhere that it's going to be bonded, we've got to have a good etch. And we need to apply bonding agent to the entire area that's being covered. We need to use a matrix or Teflon tape for separation of teeth, get correct anatomical contact. And very important that we layer the composite and cure from the sides of the tooth first. Interproximal finishing with graded strips, and be able to pass the floss test where we can floss between the teeth and there's no fraying and create the correct anatomical anatomy and have correct occlusion to centric, protrusive, and lateral excursions. And finally, it should be super smooth. The patient can feel things with their tongue that we don't really see. So we have to use our explorer to make sure that there are no, no defects. My personal goal is for dental graduates from the school where I teach now to routinely produce 20 year plus composite restoration. My hope is that all of you listening will adopt this as your own goal and um, give patients something that's gonna be long lasting. Hey, why do we etch enamel for 20 seconds? It improves the marginal seal and micromechanical bonding. If you look at this electron microscope photograph, this is unetched enamel. And these are examples of enamel that's been etched with phosphoric acid. So you can see that when the bonding agent flows into there, it's going to be mechanically locked and bonded to the enamel surface. And then of course the composite will chemically bond to the bonding agent. So that's a 20 second etch. For maximum bond strength. Enamel is an inorganic substance and needs to be etched for at least 20 seconds. <clears throat> Dentin is more organic in nature and needs to be etched for no more than 10 seconds. Otherwise, you're going to have sensitivity. Let's explore that a little bit. So, diagrammatically, these are dental tubules and there's dental, dental fluid in them. And when we cut dentin, we create what's called a smear layer. This is what the smear layer looks like. And then when we etch that with phosphoric acid for 10 seconds, it penetrates down into the dental tubules. And we don't want to go too far, do we? So that's why I say 10 seconds for total etch. Then we have a demineralized zone that microscopically looks like this. This would be the smear layer on this side. And after you've etched for 10 seconds, it actually opens up the dental tubules so that we can get resin down in them. So if we over etch, this is what happens. In a 10 second etch, it penetrates into the dental tubules. But if we go longer than that, it goes much deeper. So that when we put the bonding agent in, we're completely getting down to where we've etched, but it's not going to go as far because we've etched too far with the 20 second etch. Now, after we have washed it, 
And if we dry the dentin out, what happens, the black is Sorry, okay. So if we depict water as black and we over dry, then what happens is the dental substance sort of collapses like seaweed when the tide goes out. Then when the dentin primer goes in, it doesn't penetrate all into all the way into those collagen fibers. So that's the problem with overdrawing. Now, what if we leave it too wet? What happens? So here we are with the water, and we don't dry it enough then water is left in the primer and weakens the bond. So how do we overcome that? Well, we put etchant on the enamel around the periphery, count to 10. Then we fill the tooth with etchant and count to 10 again. And so by the time we wash, we will have a 20 second etch on the enamel and 10 second etch on the dentin. So now we're going to wash this. And instead of air drying it and possibly excessively drying, over excessively drying it, we just put the vacuum on it and then take a cotton pellet. and just dab it dry. That way it leaves the dentin moist, but no puddling or excess water. And then I like to use consepsis to um, re-wet it and do the same thing, because that kills the residual bacteria. It also inhibits the MMPs, which enhances the bond strength. So getting back to our demineralized dentin, we place primer, we air dry it to remove the solvent. The primer penetrates into the dental tubules and the adhesive and the primer are all in one bottle now. So it, uh, to appear now microscopically, this is what it looks like. So we have this hybrid layer with the resin penetrating down into the dental tubules. With this type of procedure, you can get pretty high adhesive rates, 40 to 60 megapascals. So this is what I was talking about sooner. Or, I'm sorry, previously, placing etchant around the enamel, count to 10 seconds, then fill the whole tooth over the dentin for another 10 seconds, and then wash dry, re-wet with consepsis and blot dry. And then we rub in the bonding agent for 10 seconds, and air dry it for 10 seconds, removing the solvent, and then light cure it. This is depicting what it should appear like. Now, the one on the left, it should be shiny like this. If it isn't, we didn't get enough resin on it. So I mentioned PRRs before. So, this is a situation where it doesn't quite go through the enamel into the dentin. So if that's the case and it only takes us five minutes to do it, we can charge less than we would for restoration. 
if it goes into the dentin, then it is a restoration of new charge accordingly. So this would be definitely a class one restoration into the dentin. And you have to anesthetize to do that. So let's talk about technique and show a few videos here. Let's say we have a tooth that has caries in the central fossa. And we take a number four round burr, and clean that out. But then in the other grooves where we may see a little discoloration or a little stick, what we do is go to a number half round burr and just explore those grooves and make sure that the carriage doesn't go in much any deeper. So you see, this becomes a combination of a restoration and like a sealant with a little bit of a twist, which I'll talk about in a minute. But by doing it this way, we're removing very little tooth structure. So let's compare that with a traditional preparation that we learned in dental school. So can you see how the tooth that's been prepared with a very nice preparation for amalgam has really been compromised quite a bit, whereas this one is gonna be much stronger. Now you can't fill this one with amalgam. We need to use composite. This can be done with amalgam or composite. But why remove that much tooth structure if we only have to remove that much? So now what we do is we go in and we etch, wash, dry, re-wet with consepsis, then blot dry with cotton and apply your bonding agent, rub it in for 10 seconds, lightly dry it for 10 seconds, air thin it, and then light cure it for 20 seconds, and we are ready to fill. So instead of using sealant, we're going to use regular restorable composite. Now those half millimeter openings are not very big, but you can condense and compress the composite right down in there. And this is gonna be much stronger and it's not going to wear like sealant would. Then you can use your very small ball burnisher, compress that into the preparation and start forming the anatomy. We can spend a little bit of time here and get that tooth form really, really close. Before we do the final polymerization. And then as we talked about before, we cure through the buccal surface 20 seconds, lingual 20 seconds, and then finally come in from the occlusal and completely light it up. Next thing we wanna do is take an explorer and check the margins. Make sure everything is filled, no voids or overhangs. So we're not filling any voids, but we may clicking a little bit for some overhangs. So when we're checking from with an explorer, it looks something like this. We're going from restorative material to two structure, and if it catches, then we didn't get enough restorative material and we need to add some more. Then 
checking the other direction. So if we're going from two strokes to restore material and we get a catch, that's an overhang. So we grind it off. Whenever we're finishing and polishing, we want to use slow speed and a very light touch. If we heat that composite up, it has a deleterious effect on the chemical composition of it and it won't last as long. So Whatever finishing we're going to do, we're going to do it with slow speed and light touch. We'll get the illusion adjusted. I like to use a number four round burr for the anatomy and for the margins. It seems to work quite well and it's very fast. And then you can go to your jiffy finishing cups and or your, Jiffy finishing points, it's the green, the yellow, and the white. And this will give you a very, very nice finish. I'm just demonstrating the white one here. This tooth has a DO amalgam in it, and the tooth is quite discolored and the patient was not happy with the way it looked. And you can see it's leaking. So we cleaned it out. It went quite deep on the axial wall. So that was based out with a glass ionomer cement base. So after going that far with it, looking at it from the buckle, the dark shadow that was showing through the tooth is gone. So in this case, it was decided to restore it with composite. And here's the result. So not only is the tooth healthier and sealed up better, but it looks a lot better now. This is another case done by a dental student. Uh, under my supervision. Similar situation, the restoration was leaking. It's cleaned out and replaced with composite. And that's it.